this is our uh, last uh, class before um, Christmas and before the end of the year. Uh, so I thought that perhaps it will be good to um, return to the beginning of our class uh, when we uh, discussed uh, and reflect upon uh, the very uh, essential question what it is at all philosophy. And already in our first class I mentioned the founding father of uh, Western uh, philosophy, uh, namely Socrates. And uh, perhaps uh, after already uh, many meetings and uh, very good exchange of ideas, uh, you have already uh, advanced in your thinking about philosophy. You are familiar with many possible um, a way to think about from media, daily life, uh, religion, etc., etc. Uh, so let us uh, focus our attention uh, in uh, my three introductory films on this uh, emblematic uh, and most important perhaps figure uh, in our field, namely Socrates. And I divided, uh, as usual, uh, this introductory films in three three parts. The first will be dedicated exactly to Socrates and particularly his um, uh, last hours of his life and uh, particular to his defense. As you know, he was accused to be cor corrupter of youth, of being an atheist, you know, a lot of uh, absurd uh, accusations uh, were formulated again against him by uh, very respected uh, uh, citizens of his city, Athens. Uh, but he, with calm, with uh, uh, relax, uh, with distance, uh, was affronting these accusations. And we have uh, uh, all written down by his student, Plato, exactly in apology or in defense, Socrates' defense. And you will find this text just uh, uh, 16 pages. And please, uh, if you will have time and interest, read it carefully and uh, try to discover the rhetoric behind the very uh, arguments used by uh, his opponents or his accusers and by himself and uh, I think we uh, reading this defense uh, I will quote a few passages from this um, uh, defense of Socrates and you will see uh, which kind of arguments uh, he was using to defend himself. Uh, the second uh, part or second film will be a, a kind of comparison between uh, Socrates and particularly his death uh, with death of another important figure in uh, our Western civilization, not only in Western civilization, but uh, we can say today in the globally, global, um, uh, the figure of global dimension namely Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Christ, uh, who um, was also accused uh, to committing several crimes by uh, religious uh, authority and also by political authority. And uh, I put on uh, the platform uh, uh, perhaps well known to you text, uh, one of the Gospels, according to John, because it seems that uh, this um, uh, Gospel, the fourth from four, is the very accurate, is, is historically very precise. So uh, please read, uh, if you will have time, just uh, the last uh, few chapters, starting from 16th, um, uh, and uh, to compare how Jesus uh, faced accusations, his process, 
and uh, you will discover surprising similarities between both um, processes and also arguments uh, of accusers are surprisingly uh, similar. Uh, I'm not the first uh, who did uh, who is doing this uh, comparison. In fact, I uh, send you uh, one of many books dedicated to this topic, to this comparison between uh, Socrates and Jesus. Uh, this is an older book written already at, at the end of uh, 19th century, but reprinted several times, written by uh, one historian who was uh, uh, teaching uh, at one of American University in, in Michigan University. Uh, so it's worth it to, 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 to have a look in this book, but most important for me is to compare this defense, Socrates defense and, and the process of Jesus. So it will be the second part. And the third, as usual, will be an invitation for your own uh, reflection on how relevant these two figures, and particularly the final days or hours of their respective life, could be for us today. So let us uh, return to Socrates and his um, defense um, against his accusers. Uh, so what is um, important also that uh, perhaps you know this, uh, you remember that uh, Socrates was uh, considered as the wisest man of his time. But it was not his uh, own words, because everyone could say that I'm the wisest, I, I understand better the, than others. Uh, the, the reality, but it was the, the testimony of a prophetess, of a woman uh, named Pythia, uh, who was, uh, you know, saying uh, different things, but usually they were revelatory things. So according to Pythia, exactly Socrates was uh, the wisest man. And why? The argument why she said this is also interesting because he was the only one who said about himself that I don't know nothing. Uh, and of course, it's, it's again nothing particular because everybody could recognize limits of his knowledge, but he was uh, not only admitting this, but he was proud of it. He was someone who was saying, I don't know nothing. And for him, this recognizing limits of his knowledge was the beginning to questions, to searching for real knowledge. And probably he, with his questions, was so irritating for others who were convinced that they know that they, that they know, that they uh, possess uh, very good knowledge, it was unsupportable. And this is why he was uh, accused of demoralization of youth, right? because he, he taught them not to uh, recognize authorities because someone has certain position in, uh, in politics or in military, in many, you know, we can imagine different or religious leaders, nobody is the holy cow, uh, said um, uh, Socrates. And this um, awareness of uh, having limits was extremely liberating because it was the beginning of acquisition of real, real knowledge. And so it was a kind of divine uh, witness because Petya was considered as a prophetess, as someone who is speaking in the name of God. And uh, Socrates simply recognized the fact, well, I am considered as the wisest and I try to share this wisdom with others. And uh, okay, so, and you will see in the, in the text 
that the accusers um, told him that he will be liberated, he will be not condemned if he stopped to speak to others, if he will stop to teach youth. And Socrates said, I'm sorry, but I can't because what I'm doing is a kind of divine mission. I cannot stop. And perhaps I will, I will quote this passage because it's very, very um, important. So he is saying, Men of Athens, I honor and love you, but I shall obey God rather than you. And while I have life and strength, I shall never cease from the practice of teaching of philosophy, exhorting anyone whom I meet after my manner and convincing him, saying, Oh, my friend, why do you, uh, who are a citizens of the great and mighty and wise city of Athens, care so much about lying up the greatest amount of money, etc. So this is what I, what I want to stress, that he was um, defending his uh, manner of teaching as um, a kind of divine uh, legacy. He could not stop to teach because God required to do this from him. And how he considered his his position, this is very interesting. He said, well, I'm, I'm not a uh, recognized uh, philosophical authority, but I have a certain function to fulfill exactly between you citizens, inhabitants of Athens. And he, he is describing himself, who the I am. And this is the very interesting word, get fly. Get fly, yes in Polish, muchata, <laughs> drażniąca, yes, get fly. So please listen for the moment. For if you kill me, you will not easily find anyone like me, who, if I may use such a ludicrous figure of speech, am a sort of get fly given to the state by the God. And the state is like a great and noble steed who is tarred in his motions owing to his very size and requires to be steered into life. I am that get fly which God has given the state and all day long and all in all places am always fastening upon you arousing and persuading and reproaching you and as you will not easily find anyone and another like me i would advise you to spare me i dare say that you may feel irritated at being suddenly awakened when you are caught napping and you may think that if you were to strike me dead or oh, athens uh, Anitus advises, which you easily might, then you will, would slip on the reminder of your life. So this is the real mission, to wake up people, to start to think. I think this is, this is very important. The mission of, of Socrates, and this is why he is so important even today, is not to leave people um, happy with their own state of um, uh, being not aware of what is going on around. And uh, as you know, his last moment is very, very tragic. He was condemned to death, but he accepted this, his destiny. And I will quote only last, uh, last sentence from, from this long uh, Socrates defense. So he said uh, to his accusers and to judges that for which reason also I'm not angry with you, my accusers or my condemners. They have done me no harm, although neither of them meant to 
do me any good, and for this I am gently blame them. So, uh, and the last, uh, very last sentence, the hour of departure has arrived, and we go our ways, I to die and you to live, which is better God only knows. And I think this is very important statement at the end. He's not blaming anybody. He like uh, give his life, his happiness in the hand of, of God. And God has to be the, the last uh, judge, uh, not only on, on his life and his deeds and his words, but also on his uh, accusers. And I think this is very interesting. So next uh, film will be about uh, similarities and differences between Socrates and Jesus.